In this episode of Futures in Biotech, Dr. Elizabeth Winzeller describes her approaches to drug discovery. She is on a mission to tackle malaria, a disease that affects between 250 and 500 million people per year. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 89, towards curing malaria with Dr. Elizabeth Winzeller. I believe that biotech This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by Ford, featuring Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync is the in-car communications, entertainment, and connectivity system that's voice activated to keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there going to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. And how close are we to actually having a therapy or something? Ballpark, 10 years. So potentially one of the things that will end up rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun's the center of the universe, so oh, this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier. Um, every so often, towards, especially towards the end of the year, we do a panel show where we bring in uh, five or six PhDs. We talk about the best scientific papers of the year. And uh, then what I do is I do that show in part so that I can uh, go find out what the best papers are and then contact the authors and see if I can get them on the show. And that way we, we cover some really top science. Well, today it was kind of flipped. I asked a guest to come on the show and lo and behold, uh, she had a paper come out in Science yesterday or today. It depends if you, uh, it's, it's kind of dated, dated yesterday. All right, which I consider probably going to be one of the most important papers of the year. And we'll, we'll provide a link to it. Um, and it, it, it tackles, it's a, it's a huge quest to tackle malaria. And, um, you know, if there's uh, ever a large feat that, you know, some personal endeavor, uh, you know, somebody taking on that kind of personal endeavor. Malaria affects, I think, between 250 and 500 million people per year. So it's a huge quest, a very difficult problem to tackle. But our guest uh, is, you know, on track to, uh, to tackle it, which is, uh, I think, quite amazing. Uh, she is, the, uh, she is a, an associate professor of genetics at the Scripps Research Institute and the department head of Cellular Biology at the Genomics Institute of Novartis Research Foundation in San Diego. Uh, our guest is Dr. Elizabeth Winzeller. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, we were talking a little bit before the show uh, about some of your earlier projects, were, which were at the time also extremely uh, ambitious. And, um, you know, we've even made reference to uh, the, the project that we were talking about in an interview with uh, Susan Lindquist, who was using the tools that you developed, um, which um, are, are pretty cool. So first, I guess I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to be able to introduce you to our audience and so they get to know you, where you're from, how you got into science, and uh, um, perhaps you could start with that. Uh, you, know, you, you were mentioning that you know how to code, uh, write code, so... I, I, how did you, it, how did it's, you it's a point? long and winding road. So I grew up in Reno, Nevada, and um, I was mostly an art major, or I, I guess as in high school, most of the time I just spent most of my time painting and things like that. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, except that I wanted to go someplace where it rained a lot, since it doesn't rain in Reno, and I was attracted to the Pacific Northwest, and I went up to Lewis and Clark College. And I studied art and did sculpture, but also being realistic about chances that artists have to make it in this life. I, I also got a degree in science, um, in natural sciences, thinking I might go to medical school. Uh, but mostly I was a sculpture student. And then after that, I was a bit lost and I wasn't really sure I wanted to go to medical school. And a friend of mine friend of my parents invited me out to Washington, D.C. Uh, to write code for the government because she had heard that I was good at math. 
And this was back in the old days when we when we used DOS and, and PCXTs and, and so forth. And I went and moved and programmed computers for the consumer the housing component of the computer consumer price index for about a couple of years before I dis- discovered that I really didn't want to spend my whole life sitting in a cube and uh, <laughs> I wanted to try some new things. So then I decided to get a graduate school. And um, since art was always my first love, I thought maybe I would try to pursue a master's of fine arts. And uh, I, I applied to several schools and um, I, was, I was rejected. So after that disheartening experience, I decided that I would try perhaps, maybe they would want me in science. And in fact, they, they did want me in science a bit more. Um, so I started out uh, initially by going back and getting a master's degree in biochemistry and biophysics at Oregon State. And then after having thought about different biological problems and so forth, I decided uh, to transfer to Stanford University. And I went to the Department of Developmental Biology, mostly because I was interested in, in how um, DNA is translated into a three-dimensional organism. And I started working on genetics uh, with a woman named Lucy Shapiro, who works on on Colobacter at Stanford. And then after that, I moved to the Department of Biochemistry to work with with Ron Davis. And that's more where the story starts. Uh, So Ron was, this was in 1996, uh, the the yeast genome of Saccharomyces cerevisiae had just been sequenced. And, uh, and... When I had a conversation with Ron Davis, he said, and I I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do since I've never been really sure what I wanted to do. And he said, Elizabeth, the the yeast genome has has just been sequenced and I I think there might be some opportunities there for you. And, And I said, well, there's a lot of people that work on yeast and I'm not really sure I can make a difference. And he says, believe me, there's opportunities. And so, so I worked on yeast and one of the projects was to create knockout strains for each of the genes in the yeast genome. Uh, we also did some of the original gene expression profiling experiments and uh, developed methods for looking and discovering allelic variation in yeast. These papers have been have proven to be highly cited, I guess. And but it was a lot of fun. And part of the reason that I was able to make a lot of differences is I was one of the few people in the laboratory at the time uh, that actually knew how to write code. And so. My job as a new postdoc in the lab was to write a series of Perl scripts to go through the the newly minted genome sequence, pull out primers that could be used to amplify each of the genes in in the gene in the genome, um, make a database where all the information could be served, serve this database to various collaborators throughout the world, and and then also round people up. So, and. Uh, it turned out to be a good project. Let me ask you about that. So this is at a time, I suppose, when, you know, the, the liquid handling robots are slowly coming into the, onto the market. Um, did you, so you basically had to amplify every single gene of yeast uh, uh, and then do a, a disrupt each single gene. And there's, you, you said uh, so four to 6,000. Yeah, the, the, there are about 6,000 genes and, and it wasn't just me. Uh, because we had uh, assembled a consortium, many uh, consisting mostly of former Ron Davis postdocs, and what we did was we um, we we synthesized all the primers using a 96 well oligonucleotide synthesizer that someone at the at the Genome Center had, had constructed, and uh, then we made series of primers so that you could take a 96 well pipette min and then you could mix them together and we would send out groups of eight or nine blocks of 96 well primers to the different consortium laboratories that included Mike Snyder, um, Mark Johnston, Jasper Ryan. And uh, then the people in the remote laboratory would involve a, a, a uh, often an undergrad, as was the case at Yale with Mike Snyder. And this person would mix the primers together and do the knockouts, do uh, tetrad dissection to confirm the knockouts, do PCR, and then would ultimately send the uh, strains back to us. And we would collate everything, put it into the freezers, and eventually this allowed us to create a collection of, of strains that's now been distributed across the world. 
it, that's a <laughs> that's a lot of work. That's an enormous amount of work. Um, how how would somebody yep. use uh, mm-hmm. the, this knockout library of of genes in yeast? So it's it's been really important for doing functional genomic studies. Uh, one of the things that we did on that with that collection is that we introduced a series of barcodes into each into each strain, and this allowed us to grow the par- the 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 yeast in bulk. So each individual knockout strain contained a little barcode that could be amplified using a, a pair of common primers. And therefore we could grow the, the yeast in a flask and expose them to different drugs and we could find out which yeast were more sensitive to a drug or a condition and uh, this allowed us to, for example, identify the complete set of genes that are involved that are needed for you know growth in a uh, high osmolarity medium or something like that. Um, it can also be used to find drug targets. And the knockout strains have been used individually by many, many laboratories. Uh, so if, I think I they're you, still being heavily used by you know groups, especially in Toronto. Um, uh, Charlie Charlie Boone, Gorgi Aver. I guess if you have a drug that you're trying to do determine if it has any kind of... Uh, uh, inherent toxicity to it, you could test it in the, the 4,000 strains and see if it, it, it has a, uh, ends up with a profile of... In particular, what, what, what people do, um, and we've done this ourselves, is that uh, we made heterozygous. So the yeast can exist as a, as a, with a single copy or with two copies of its genome as a haploid or a diploid. And for essential genes, you can only knock out one of the two copies and you can only do this in the diploid organism. And so uh, it turns out that if you only have one copy of a particular drug target, it makes you ultra sensitive to a compound that's hitting that target. So uh, for example, um, dihydrofolate, theoretically dihydrofolate reductase, you're missing one of the two copies in a, in a diploid strain and you treat with a DHFR inhibitor and that would make you grow slower than the neighboring yeast that has two copies. And by amplifying the barcodes from all of them and putting them on a, on a, a microarray, or you could possibly do some sort of sequencing now, you can then find out which of the 6,000 or strains has a, 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 an exceptional sensitivity to a particular drug, and this can be used to, to find drug targets. Um, two elements of this project, right, that jump out at me. One, it's uh, back in 1995, 96, 97. It, it's an enormously ambitious project, uh, technically uh, doable, very doable, but very technically challenging in terms of the scale. And then uh, the fact that there's, you know, there's two kinds of science, right? There's discovery science, uh, you know, fishing experiments, and then there's, you know, uh, a, a, um, a reductionist approach to dissecting a biological pathway or biological function. And uh, um, are you are you particularly attracted to doing research that is discovery, uh, large scale discovery, or do you? I mean, is is that what attracted you to that project? And is that well, has that influenced you know, your that, future work? That, that sort of work was just emerging at the time, and uh, we we those of us who were attracted this, to this sort of work did get a lot of criticism in the beginning from from the the reductionists. Uh, I have <laughs> sorts of you know, scathing comments on grant applications. So <laughs> starting when I was a postdoc, it <laughs> just, just kept going. But I've always loved that sort of thing. And, and it, was, it was really fun to be in the laboratory at that time. Uh, it, you know, at Stanford Biochemistry, it was right when microarrays were being developed. A lot of technology for doing high throughput discovery based research was coming out. And it was, it was just an incredibly exciting time. Um, and I, so I appreciate you uh, doing this kind of uh, sort of more uh, discovery science than the, the reductionist stuff because it, when, when we're writing grants, uh, if you can do it successfully, then we can all follow in your footsteps and say, look, other people are doing it and it's leading to, uh, you know, uh, changes in, in society, uh, beneficial changes to society. So keep, keep at it. Yep. That's one of the reasons why you're here because I want to learn, uh, from, uh, learn from you what you do and uh, how to do it right. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about your, your current lab and, and what is, are the main focuses of your current lab? 
Yeah, so the, the reason I ended up down in San Diego was um, in 1999 when I was looking for a faculty position, um, Pete Schultz was setting up an institute uh, that was partially funded by Novartis. And uh, I'd gone around and interviewed at a number of spots um, in 1999, and, uh, and I encountered many people who, who had reductionist ways of thinking and I said and they asked me what gene I wanted to work on and I said I don't want to work on one gene I want to work on all genes and then they kind of raised their eyebrows and said ah that's that's not an appropriate project for an assistant professor and and, and you need to really focus down and figure out what problem you want to work on and so I uh, was slightly disheartened, but I went uh, to talk to Pete Schultz, who I knew because he had collaborated with with the, with one of my collaborators, David Lockhart, and he and I told him, you know, I was looking for a job, and then he said, "Oh, you know what? We're going to set up a functional genomics institute. We're going to do discovery science, and we're going to build screening equipment, and we're going to have proteomics, and we're going to have sequencing, and we're going to put all of these really really expensive tools together in one spot, and, and then we'll." bring in other fairly junior people and they can all share in these really t expensive tools that they wouldn't normally get their hands on if, if they went off and became an assistant professor in their own little um, uh, small space. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought that was sounded like um, a good opportunity and because it allowed me to do what I what I was probably familiar with. And so I I moved down to, to San Diego to, to join GNF. Uh, was, uh, was there about one of the about three months after it opened, and about a year after that, I started uh, working. Uh, I obtained a joint appointment at the Scripps Research Institute. So, we for a real while worked on worked on Saccharomyces, but then um, I was able to, or I was given the opportunity to really set up. Uh, a malaria lab at that time. And I had always been interested in malaria, I'd been interested in parasites and tropical diseases. I, my father's actually an anthropologist. I had uh, spent time in, in Southeast Asia as a child. And uh, Ron Davis, my postdoc advisor, had actually been involved in sequencing the malaria genome. And thus, um, when it became clear that I could recruit a postdoc that was inter that had a background in malaria, I, I thought, oh, this sounds really good. And of course, we have all these small molecules here, and we have this screening screening equipment. <laughs> and um, one of the real advantages of doing genomics and functional and then discovery based research is that you don't actually have to have a hypothesis about what target is good or, or where you're going. And that's really good for organisms that are difficult to work on, like malaria. So um, I started building some chips. Um, we started playing around with drug discovery, doing some bioinformatics, uh, mostly because I knew that this was something that would be relatively easy to do. And then after a few years of practicing, uh, we managed to get together a, a grant to, to do some of the drug discovery work with the equipment at GNF. Before we get into the drug discovery, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about this work. Did, so did you uh, do infect uh, some model organisms and look at the changes in gene profile in the organisms looking for potential targets or just look for, uh, maybe you could tell us about that, that first uh, so systems biology approach. Yeah, so one of the first things that we did was to uh, build an affymetrics array that basically tiled through the genome of the parasite that causes malaria. Uh, and that was created shortly uh, before, or shortly, it was designed about the time the, the genome sequence was coming out. And the idea was that we could use this for looking at how, for annotating the genome. So the, the, the approach was to try to collect gene expression data from all different life cycle stages from inside the mosquito. I think you actually have a picture of the life cycle that you were going to show maybe. Um, yeah, let's, maybe we could try to pull that up. That would be great. Uh, Liz? And there we go. Wow. That's okay. page two. <laughs> Second image. That's the, We need to go to the first one. Um, this, is, this is an art, by the way, podcasting. All right. There we are. Wow. Okay. So uh, I see a mosquito. It seems to be sitting on a leaf. 
No, it's on a person. Okay. Maybe you could describe this for us. So anyway, malaria is transmitted by the bite of an anopheline mosquito. The mosquito bites you, and when it bites you, it transmits, it, it releases uh, hundreds of sporozoites uh, into your bloodstream, and they eventually migrate to, to the liver. Um, and within the liver, they form these hepatocytes. Uh, they invade hepatocytes and, and eventually form liver schizonts. Some species of malaria, they can lie dormant for, for many years, but in most species, they, 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 they remain quiescent for about a week or so. There's no symptoms, and then eventually they're released into the bloodstream. And once they get into the bloodstream, they invade red cells, and they multiply very rapidly, and this is where you begin having symptomatic um, infections with malaria. So it's uh, characterized by high fever, chills, uh, you can go into a coma. Um, it, it's fairly lethal um, without treatment, especially for small children or for people who are not immune, such as uh, you or me. And uh, eventually, maybe when the parasites begin to feel stressed, they be, decide that it's time to think about an exit strategy, and uh, they form male and female gametocytes, uh, which are fairly innocuous, but they, they circulate in the bloodstream. And, and when a mosquito bites you again and takes these up, um, they immediately differentiate, differentiate into, into gametes and um, they will mate with one another or they will mate with what other type of mosquito, or what other, uh, with another parasite that might have been present at that time. I mean, another malaria parasite, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually... They uh, form a zygote. Uh, you undergo meiosis at this time. The parasites are haploid up until this point. There's a brief diploid phase followed by a meiotic reduction. And then this okinete migrates across the midgut and then forms an oocyst. Uh, oocyst. Um, there's more DNA replication. You go back to a haploid genome at this point, and then the uh, sporozoites are released from the oocyst, and they migrate to the salivary gland, where the cycle starts again. And wow. um, we should have warned so, the audience. <laughs> I think this is pretty uh, scary. Um, you know, there's horror movies, okay. and then there's there's malaria. <laughs> this is okay. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you, but this is. Uh, this is I, I'll encourage people to go to the website and follow the the life cycle um, because this complex life cycle introduces some complexity when it comes to doing drug discovery, right? If you're trying to make a, a vaccine, usually there's you know a virus and there's one shape of the virus. Sometimes it's slightly modified. Here you have uh, a very complex life cycle. So how does that? So what what's the next step? You, you decided so, malaria. Um, then... We can go back to, so initially what we were thinking of doing was, you know, finding drug or GPCRs or something like that. And uh, the a, problem let's was... Let's pause for a that... second here. Let's, sorry, um, we're, we're having some trouble with the uh, the audio and video. Could yeah, you please put a marker? Okay. Can, maybe, Elizabeth, I'm thinking about just calling you back, hanging up and calling back, because we've been having a okay. little consistent, so... Maybe we'll okay. just try to reboot it. Um, right, one thing you should for... do is definitely turn off any background uh, apps. If you have mail that's uh, open or if you okay. have um, Dropbox that's open, you might want to quit that. Any kind of web apps, just close them and they'll call you back. Okay, I'll call you right back, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Um. I suspect there's quite a few people at Scripps that are watching. <laughs> we had some really hard times uh, with a microbiologist from Princeton, um, Bonnie Bassler. Her video just was all over the place. Um, it was very, very difficult. Um, although Scripps should have a good internet. Um, they are busy at this time of day. Um, yeah, and this is the point where we release mosquitoes into the audience <laughs> I didn't think that was I thought that was a good move for from uh, Bill Gates I think is one of his smartest moves it's a problem that everybody has to uh, uh, you know 500 million people have to suffer with malaria and uh, well, no fault of their own but no fault of humanity this is a, 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 a foe Thanks for Elizabeth back. I'm getting no answer. 
Another try. She might be rebooting, but I don't think so. Uh, Sybil says, thanks for ful fulfilling my wish to hear about Plasmodia. <laughs> um, th this is an example of, of, of it's her, we're going to talk about her work on drug discovery, and it, it's a beautiful example of picking a disease and fixing it. And it kind of goes against traditional academic genetics or uh, cell biology. Um, usually this is under the realm of uh, translational science. Uh, people identify targets, drug targets, and they move it out. But, um, so this is, she's, you know, sort of leading the way with respect to the academic side. Okay, I have to, I pulled out the uh, mm -hmm. headset again. Right. Put it back in now. So I've got no video, I hear you, but I've got no video. No video? Yeah, I've got a video of you right now. It might take oh, a second. Oh. oh, there we go. It's coming. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Beautiful. All right, let's try it again, shall we? Okay. I'm just going to put this. Hello? Can you hear us? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. Great. Um, we were talking about... Um, yeah, let me sort just put up a still so that Jeff can kind of just get a big visual of when um, kind of they're getting back into it. <laughs> For those who have just tuned in, uh, you're watching Futures in Biotech and we're interviewing uh, Dr. Elizabeth Winzeller. And we're talking about drug discovery and malaria, tackling a, a, a massive... Uh, human foe. Uh, um, so uh, we're, we're, can we roll back the tape? And <laughs> so we were talking about picking malaria as a, as a, as, as a disorder. You, you explained the life cycle. Right. And, and then where were we exactly? Um, well, we can. We were talking about uh, looking at different stages in the life cycle and looking at gene expression. The complex life cycle. Right. And so um, when the genome was sequenced, one of the, the features that came out was that most of the genes uh, were uncharacterized and no one had worked on them in any species. It was hard to annotate the genome. It's, it was very, very AT rich. And um, the question is, what, what are all of these genes doing and, and what are their possible functions? And so the idea we had was to collect gene expression, was to collect RNA from as many different life cycle stages as possible that we showed you before. Um, uh, to collect them from these gametocytes, to collect them throughout the erythrocytic cycle, to uh, collect them from mosquitoes if possible. And that we would make then a compendium of gene expression data. And the idea was that genes that were involved in similar processes, uh, for example, in you know, glycolysis or, or something like that, would all uh, show coordinated up or down regulation within the life cycle. So we took RNA from all these different stages. We put it on this high-density microarray. And then we put it through massive clustering, and then we were actually able to show that, you know, that all the genes that we thought were involved in sexual development, were, most of them were coming up at the same time. Uh, ones that we knew were involved in merozoite function were all coming up at the same time. And that allowed us to begin to predict what the function of a many of the uncharacterized genes, especially if they showed really, really highly correlated expression with, with known genes. Uh, so that that basically gave us a map, and and from that, you know, we started playing around with with different kinases and so forth uh, that we thought might be interesting drug targets. So um, that's where we were about five years ago. However, uh, one of the things that sort of came out with this is that, you know, it, there were a number of kinases that we thought would be interesting to work on. And we started to try to express them. And of course, there's always stories about how difficult malaria is to work on because of the really high recombinogenic AT content of the genome. People clone the genes and then they, they recombine with one another and they, they disappear. And then people are frustrated and it takes a long time. And, uh, and at the same time, we're going, well, you know, we're not really going to do anything with any compound that hits a kinase unless it's going to hit the cell anyway. So why don't we just start by doing cellular screening and, and forget about this target, all these targets that we came up with. 
And so, of course, we, I always, I don't like to take too many risks. So I did this sort of on the side. We started doing this on the side while we continued Gorilla to. Gorilla science, you know. <laughs> Before you tell us about the, the gorilla science of this, this side cellular approach, I'd like to ask your, your, your opinion on using kinases as drug targets um, and their ability to actually get all the way through a, a, a drug development program. Um, you know, kinases are, are sort of signaling, I mean, for the audience, they're, they're signaling molecules that trigger, uh, uh, that activate pathways somewhat. They're the protein dip switches inside the cell that say, it's, imp it's time now to divide. It's time now to uh, undergo uh, a form of metabolism or any housekeeping or uh, differentiation. Or, you know, there's all the biological processes. But the kinases themselves are fairly conserved. Um, and uh, they're they're close, fairly closely related, and if you develop a drug towards one, you're gonna you could affect not only what's under its control directly, but some of the downstream elements that might be tangential to the original biological process that you're trying to stop. But yes, I don't know. Am I wrong? Is this? What do you think? Well, that that's a concern, and and I guess our thought was that with enough chemistry expertise, we could we could actually build out ones that were specific for malaria. Okay. Um. But I think at the end of the day, what ended up happening was that the chemists we were working with were much more attracted to the compounds that came from a lot of our cellular hits, uh, and not so much for the ones that were were hitting the kinases. And uh, that's how sort of the program got started. So However, I, I will say that. Cell hit. Sorry, we, so, we, we do have a one second lag. So we're, because I'm in Cleveland, you're in Southern California, they're in Northern California. We have about a one second lag. So this is kind of like talking to someone on the moon. So if I interrupt, I apologize. Um, I, I was just going to ask you, perhaps you could explain the term cellular uh, hits. And okay, so um, what I mean by cellular hit is that uh, what we ended up going to do is um, just taking, so malaria parasites, you can culture them in the laboratory by, by just uh, adding some human red blood cells that you get with, from a donor, and you can add your compound and, and some growth media, and you can, you can incubate them all together in a really tiny uh, microtiter format, 384 or 1536 well. Put them together for a couple days, and then you want to go find out which of the compounds actually blocked parasite growth and repli replication. And you do that by staining with the dye that binds the DNA of the parasite. Uh, red blood cells don't have any DNA in them. But they, they become enucleated if they're human. And then eventually... Um, the parasites do have DNA, so if they grow for a couple days, you can see an increase in the DNA content that be, can be detected with a with a um, with a dye called cybergreen or other DNA binding dyes. And thus, you can um, look for those compounds that block the parasite growth and development in the in the erythrocytes. And uh, we were able to be, we were able to automate this whole process so that we could go through eventually go through about two million compounds to find ones that 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 were effective at blocking parasite growth and replication. So you basically uh, set up a cell-based uh, miniature organism that's getting affected by malaria, right? Cellular well, single cells. Well, they're, they're, it was looking at the replication of the mar malaria parasite in, in human erythrocytes, the, the natural okay. host of the parasites in your bloodstream. All right. Human red blood cells. Right. Okay. So you're, okay. Um, so you're now looking at uh, infecting human red blood cells. So you're using one stage of the life cycle, the post liver stage, or mm -hmm. do you have to, do you have to isolate the post liver stage of the, the virus or not the virus of the, the parasite? Parasite? Yeah. You can keep that going continuously in culture by continuing to add fresh red cells. Um, you have a, uh, a flask, you get red cells from a donor, you take out the white cells, um, and then you, you, as long as you continue to add fresh media and uh, red cells, the parasites will go grow indefinitely unless they get contaminated, which happens fairly frequently. <laughs> And then you have to do it two million times. 
Well, the auto, the process of automation. So at, at GNF, and I, I really didn't have anything to do with this, but um, the they they set up a system where they made banks of chemical libraries. So all of the compounds that we that we were interested in had been arrayed in these towers. And one of the, the really cool things about working there at the time, and this this is this sort of equipment is fairly commonplace nowadays, uh, but we you know we we I was around when they they built this stuff in the beginning, and so um, we had some engineers from the, stat, the Saturn Car Company build some of the robots, and the robots would come and pull these 1536 well plates out of the towers. Uh, they would stack them and do liquid dispensing very accurately and so some of the screen that we we originally did was um was run by hand and some of it was automated and and my technician david plouffe at the time had to actually and several other people that were working on this had to actually physically transport several hundred plates maybe several thousand i can't remember anyway uh, <laughs> from one screening machine to another to do the reading and and so it took altogether about three or four months but it wasn't that bad for those that but, aren't familiar with high throughput screening that means that a robot put in a drug on top of the cells in top of the right. parasite you treat them for a couple of hours to 24 hours for the parasite to grow is it was it 24 uh, hours 48 well, 48. more like 72 hours, 72 hours. So that we had, it was actually 72 now that I think about it. So, and mm -hmm. so it allows um, the parasite to replicate several times and it goes from one cell to 20 cells for each round of lysis of the red cell. So probably about a hundred fold increase in the DNA. Yes, it kills the red cell, and which is why you have fevers when you get malaria and do you, anemia. Do you Sorry, uh, we've got a, a crazy lag. My apologies. Um, you do 96 well plate or did you do 384? This was all done in plate? 1536. 1536. So 15, 1,500 uh, like test tubes equivalent in, in, in right. one single plate. Right. Um, one plate that's about what? Two by four centimeters, I guess. And I mean, two by four, uh, three by four inches. Wow. And then you have uh, for two million... You probably have several thousand plates, right? Yes, uh, fifteen hundred. So each so one of them had to be loaded up onto a cart and wheeled across. <laughs> but you have to keep them all red alive. I mean, these are fresh red blood cells. You can't yeah, well, waste them. You can't let so them go. We, so we did the dispensing with with an automated liquid dispenser. We did the incubation, then we pulled them off, um, and then we put them back on again to do a lysis step. And I believe all of the plates. Uh, eventually had to be read by hand. And so the various people that contributed to this project spent a long time pulling the plates off and putting them onto the plate reader. Um, let me, I'm going to ask it you wasn't a question. You. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, he thought of it. <laughs> they all went, oh, no. So wait. Um, no, they were all fired up by this. Uh, I, I have a great technician. I have someone in my lab uh, who's, doing who's, a screen. Who, who likes a challenge. He, you know, you tell him have, something that's too hard and, and that no one else can do it or wants to do it. And he says, show it to me, Elizabeth. <laughs> so. we, uh, I developed a, a screening assay for our work and uh, I have someone in the lab going through 200,000 compounds by hand. And I did my oh. first graduate student HTS uh, by tipping the boxes by hand on a 96 format and then did the screening on my own purified enzyme, which I'd purify in the morning and then run about 5,000 compounds in the afternoon. But we, the lab saved money by having the, the graduate students tip their boxes by hand. We had a lab of 35 people, so to save money, we did that. Yeah. Saved about 17,000 a month. But uh, So I'm going to ask you the question is, why go after the red blood cell stage if the infection's already eminent because the first part of the life cycle is the liver and uh, is that, um, so is that the best life stage to attack? Well, it but is before the... We answer it, 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 before we answer it, I, I'd better read my spot. Uh, this, this podcast is sponsored by, future, um, by Ford, so I'd, I'd better thank them. And then, we, then, then the answer, life, life stage, uh, among other things. Um, so this episode 
of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by Ford, featuring Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync is the in-car communications, entertainment, and connectivity system that's voice activated to help you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. One of the great features of Sync is Sync Services. Sync Services give you audible turn-by-turn -turn directions to where you want to go and displays directional arrows on screen, all without having to purchase an aftermarket or integrated navigation system. Sync Services also includes business search of over 40 million businesses, including telephone numbers, business information and directions, a, a send to sync feature, uh, which enables you to use Google Maps or MapQuest from your home or office computer to plan a trip. Then you can save it to your sync traffic directions and information systems account. Then you use voice commands in your vehicle to get turn by turn directions. There's a free um, uh, sync destinations app, which gives you mobile access to manage your sync traffic directions and information systems account on the go and the ability to pre-save destinations to your account, such as home or office. Plus, you can get traffic updates sent to your mobile phone via text message. It's all designed to keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Um, Ford, I'm, I'm, my mouse, by the way, I'm, I'm using a Microsoft Office and the, the scrolling is all the other way. <laughs> so at least, you know, if I was driving a car with Ford Sync, I would just mention it all with voice commands. So Ford Sync with my Ford Touch is available on uh, the Ford 2012 uh, Focus. Uh, so you can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at ford.com forward slash technology. We thank them for supporting Futures in Biotech. Um, okay, so now's the, 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 the question. Well, I guess it's kind of a tangential question, but why did you pick the red blood cell stage for your first uh, HTS high throughput screen? Um, the reason that we pick and everyone else picks the red blood cell stage is that's the one where you get the symptoms of malaria. Um, so this is, uh, if you can kill the red blood cell stages, you can make people feel better a lot quickly, more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other, the other stages are sort of icing on the cake and they're more involved in eliminating malaria, or preventing transmission of malaria, but um, they don't, removing them doesn't necessarily make you feel better. All right. Okay. So <laughs> now you've got your, your screen set up, you're throwing compounds in, and this is uh, David Plouffe who's doing it? David Plouffe, right. David, David Plouffe. And um, so he's... It's the same walking. as uh, Clinton's former, or Obama's campaign manager, I think. So David oh. Plouffe, oh, not the same person. Anyway, ah. same name. Anyway, yeah, so he's walking them all back and forth, and um, you know, one of the other things that we have is, is after the data came out, you know, we could we have historical data for all of these different compounds that were screened, and uh, we could look at the historical data and immediately flag those which had been active in other cellular assays that had been run on the same compound collection. So we could immediately find things that were specific to malaria parasites as well as ones that were broadly active and which we probably wouldn't want to develop because they'd probably be toxic. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, 48 to 72 hours of drug in the presence of, uh, so you, you have this activity, wouldn't 70, if, I mean, if you're, are you screening at like a, a fairly high concentration? And if you are, isn't that, couldn't that just be toxic to the malaria and not to the red blood cell and, and be so in a non-specific way? You know, if you throw in poison. Um, well, they were nonspecific for the, they did in general, I mean, if you, if you went really high, there could be things that were toxic to the red blood cell. But for the most part, the hits that we had clearly prevented replication of the parasite within the red cell. So they were just generally toxic to the parasite, not mm -hmm. to the red cell. And then how do, you, how do you take it to the next level? Do you, what's the next step in the, you identify a hit, where, where do you take it from there? Well, that's where the consortium came in. Uh, we got involved. We're funded by uh, uh, by the Medicines for Malaria Venture and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, we'd obtained a grant uh, to create a public-private par partnership 
that included the Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases in Singapore, the, the Institute in San Diego, the Swiss Tropical Institute, um, the, the BPRC in the Netherlands. And um, we sort of assembled this group and, and we put together a project portfolio and the cellular screen became a major part of the project portfolio. So at that point, uh, we, we brought some chemists on board and uh, they started looking at the compounds and, and, and looking at different compound families. And, and, and then they began to settle on, on several that looked, looked interesting. Uh, the first one product we ran first is a bit of a test case. These are the spiroindolones. Um, they were looking good uh, right off the bat, uh, fairly potent. Um, they didn't require a lot of optimization. And um, those have actually um, progressed quite quickly in the drug discovery pipeline. And then we've had several other scaffold families that came uh, from uh, analyzing that, that collection of data. Uh, and we have recently began looking at which of those scaffold families are also active in the hepatic stages, uh, which is the subject of the science article that was published yesterday. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the paper that was, so you, you did a, a full screen, identified how many compounds in total, how many, or structural classes, I guess, because you're going to have related cousins, right? Compound right, cousins. Right, right. So uh, in the initial screen, uh, we, we had about five or 6,000 compounds that had, that had reconfirmed activity of less than um, is it 10 micro, one micromolar. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that are about between one and 10 are sometimes it's a little bit questionable. But uh, there are about 600 scaffold classes in, within that. So you can, you can cluster the different compounds. You look at their structures and you can cluster them based on their chemical similarity. And they were about um, using reasonable cutoffs. Uh, we estimated there were about 600 different scaffold classes. And so that gave us pre-existing SAR. Uh, one of the things that we could do is that we could say that, that there are, you know, 10 members of this scaffold class in the entire 2 million compound library. And we found seven of them in our anti-malarial screen. And that gives us a high probability that this compound series is probably having something specific to do with malaria and might be worth looking at in more depth. So if you have the same hit, then a hit that's a very close neighbor to it, where maybe there's a halogen that's added, right. halogen that's moved over by one position, has, a, 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 I guess, a hydroxyl group, functional groups on the drug. So this drug is binding to some protein in the malaria parasite, right. preventing its biological function, killing it. And then when you do your screen, you're looking at uh, you've other five or 6,000 hits from 2 million, which is 0.25%. Uh, those you have a lot of related structures, so you classify those into the two ringed, three ringed, four ringed, uh, this position, that position, and then. But then, I guess as you look at the potency for these closely related molecules, you can you can pull out something called a structure activity relationship based on where the functional groups are positioned. You can get an idea as to what is causing the better drugs to be better drugs. Yes, it gives you some starting points, and then obvious. Uh, uh, clearly, the next step is to try to make these compounds much more drug-like to make them suitable for putting into humans. And uh, you know, I can't really take that much credit for this part of of the experiment. Uh, this was mostly uh, the team of chemists that worked on this at various at various points. Um, but we were able to eventually create things mm -hmm. that, that have drug-like properties. It allowed us to test them in animal models of malaria, and some of them look quite good. Some of them are being pursued in clinical trials. So um, we're really pleased, and we're really hoping that we're going to make an impact. And, and, but that, was that from this? So you had 5,000 or 6,000 from the, the, the red blood cell screen, but then you ported it in this paper. You're reporting using a liver cell that, or a type of engineered liver cell starting with a starting right. material with the drugs that were active on the red blood cell so a double whammy were, were there right. any uh, you know one of the one of the problems with having 5 or 6000 hits is that choose uh, this was actually a question that we got a lot it's like this is an embarrassment of rich, riches how are you ever going to decide which one of these scaffold families are most interesting 
and worthy of very expensive medicinal chemistry effort. And, and that's where uh, we began to think about running additional screens, uh, including the liver assay, uh, to try to prioritize sc uh, scaffold families for further development. And so you did find uh, in these liver cells drugs that would hit and yes. uh, at extreme potency. Maybe you could explain the, the, the liver the, the engineered liver cell. So the liver is, assay is even more even more uh, difficult than the blood stage assay, which was fairly simple, I must say. And uh, the reason the liver stage assay was was difficult is we had to find a source of infected mosquitoes, and and we ended up getting them from the New York University Insectary, who sent us a cage, uh, uh, a biohazard suitcase each week, um, filled with uh, mosquitoes that were infected with Plasmodium uelii, which is a rodent model of malaria. It's actually not that dangerous for humans, but it does it does cause mouse malaria. And so we would uh, get these mosquitoes and, and we would pull their heads off and we'd dissect their salivary glands out to get these sporozoites that, that are, are the things that, are tra that, that transmit malaria. And these are the, the form of the parasite that will eventually invade the liver. And so uh, we, we collected huge numbers of sporozoites. This was run over a, probably about a year. Uh, we dissected five or 6,000 mosquitoes, Stefan and uh, David Plouffe again. And then they would put them onto now 384 well plates that contain these compounds that we knew were active in blood stages and we would, and hepatocytes and then the sporozoites, we'd incubate them together. And then eventually what, what was challenging about this is only about 1% of the cells actually become infected with these sporozoites. And so you need to find these within, uh, with, within the bottom of a microtiter plate. And the way that we ended up doing it is using high content imaging. So we would take a microscope camera, this was an opera machine, and we would take about 100 images for each well in the microtiter plate. And we would use a computer script uh, written by Gislan to, to go through and, and to try to find the uh, schizonts within within the sea of human hepatocytes. And then we would determine whether the compound affected the number of, of uh, parasite schizonts as well as the size of the parasite schizonts. And what we found was that this imidazole paparazine family, uh, you know, that we also knew had good blood stage activity was also giving us a number of hits in the liver stage assay, which suggested that it, you know, it, it would also have additional activity against the liver stages. And that turned out, in fact, to be the case. And you gave them to the rodents and the rodents... Uh, these, so these, well, first of all, the, the potency... Well, they, they weren't the screening hits, okay. So yeah. it, at the same time, you know, we worked to optimize the potency against the blood stages. I didn't do that, but uh, the chemistry group did. And mm -hmm. to get rid of things that, that medicinal chemists know human bodies don't like. Reducing toxicity and so forth. And, um, so and so then the idea is to make them stable in the bloodstream for six or seven hours uh, so that, uh, you know, if something is cleared immediately from the bloodstream, it's not going to be able to stick around and, and, and kill your malaria. So they, they, they've modified these compounds and done a lot of chemistry on them to try to find which, to, to, to create ones that would be sort of drug-like. And, and then those were put into the rodent models and, uh, you know, they did have pretty good activity. In the version of the um, malaria that was uh, given to this, the, these were human liver cells, HEP-G2 cells. Are those human liver yeah, cells? They, yeah, for, if, you, if you express a CD81 marker on the, hepat on the human hepatocytes, they can, they can be invaded by rodent parasites. Wow. Okay. So you've got a rodent parasite. I mean, this, this is, this is the beauty. Like this is the beauty of the, of the assay, I think. Well, one, I think one of the beauties is, is taking... to, it's, it's almost impossible to get your hands on human sporozoites. Uh, because they're, they're, very, they're <laughs> infectious, you have infectious mosquitoes, the mosquitoes can oh, fly away. God. And there's only a couple of laboratories in the United States that actually have the ability to, to grow, uh, you know, mosquitoes that are infected with falciparum malaria. Um, yeah, you have to do that in the Antarctic, where if the mosquitoes fly away, they die. Yeah, so you can imagine it might not be much of a problem. Well, 
I mean, people would get malaria and they just have no idea where it came from, right? They, 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 and of course, you can treat it if people know you have malaria, but if you don't know you have malaria, sure. then that's when, you know, it looks ugly. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get a grasp of this. You, you, you've you got your drugs that were pre-screened in the red blood cell assay, then you're uh, using a rodent version into the these human cells, human cancer cells that are expressing a liver marker called CD81, and then you're infecting them with ice, um, sporozoites that were isolated from the salivary mm -hmm. glands of mosquitoes. Yeah, that's painstaking. How there's a little mosquito. I guess there's some joy in that, right? Where you pick off the head of the mosquito. You well, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of on that paper. It was it was a team effort. Okay. Yes, absolutely. There's um, team science, big science. So. Uh, and and then you've got a drug. You you narrow it down with medicinal chemistry. You move, improve the potency of that class of drugs, and then you give it to rodents and that are infected. Um, mm -hmm. with a rodent version and then um, you well you study the distribution of the drug and then you start all the preclinical work in the, on the rodent model. Um, I'm looking at some of the numbers uh, for those that are going to read the paper in the audience. Um, one of the things that this new to me that, that I, 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 I'm going to be hitting the wall with when I when I do it when I, we get our into our animal models is that you were giving I don't know 15 migs per kilo Dose. I mean, this is this is going to get technical, but this is for the there's there's an audience out there for highly technical biotech stuff. So you give um, 15 migs per kilo or 100 migs per kilo as two different doses, and track the the presence of the drug in the liver. And at 15 migs per kilo, you get 55 micromolar, and at 100 migs per kilo, you get 193 micromolar, which seems like 193 micromolar. Uh, first of all, 100 megs per kilo, if it was me, I would be taking over 10 grams of the drug. And then um, if there would be 193 micromolar, there would be, um, I mean, that's a, a very, well, It concentrates very in the liver, but I mean, it was uh, 15 megs per kg is not, I, uh, or 15 oh, micrograms is actually a fairly small dose. Oh, it says mil milligrams per kilo. It does. Oh, wait, right. wait. Maybe we maybe need to be checking the typos here. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, I, maybe. So it's 100 megs per kilo would be a 10 gram for an adult male, 10 grams of drug. And 193 yeah. micromolar, 193 micromolar of any organic compound will destroy any cell. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah. Well, maybe it, it's looking. worth looking over. Um, otherwise, uh, it shows a distribution in the liver, and I think that was the point of the paper, in a half-life of seven to nine hours. So the good thing about giving a drug is all drugs go to the liver, right? That's our liver's function is to clear out drugs. So targeting, I guess, isn't that difficult an issue on, in terms of medicinal chemistry and distribution. That's what you do right. want. Uh, I guess that's, that's also a benefit of developing a, a, a liver cancer drug is that it's fairly easy to get the drug to the, to the liver. Um, so now you've succeeded in, in curing... Um, with a very a double whammy drug, um, uh, eliminating traces of malaria in in the rodent model, um, have you? At what point do you protect the intellectual property of this compound? Um, that, that's always a question. Uh, is it if it's too early, then people can take your compound and derive it some more uh, with some I'm, medicinal I'm, chemistry. Uh, it's. The uh, chemists who've worked on this have protected their intellectual property. I'm not actually a, an inventor on it. But, uh, it, you know, this has all been funded by public-private partnerships. And so mm -hmm. you have to protect the intellectual property enough to give people incentives to develop it. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, malaria doesn't – malaria drugs don't make any money. And uh, I think there was a press release from Novartis about – you know, how many uh, you know, doses of coartem, and that's a, a very effective blood stage drug uh, that they actually give away per year um, to, you know, to be distributed in countries where, where people might not be able to pay for anti-malarials. So, it, you know, they're, you protect the intellectual property of anti-malarial drugs, but, but no one's making any money on it. I, I well... I, I suppose one of the main difficulties of curing a disease 
uh, is leveraging the intellectual property to raise the money for the expensive clinical trials. But I guess you could probably so, do any. So we're not. Trials. So the people who will pay for the clinical trials, or we would like to pay for the tr clinical trials, are you know our foundations, uh, such as the Medicines for Malaria Venture, which I believe is partially funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and other donors, the Wellcome Trust, and so. Um, it's it, kind of like it, an open source it, pro project, right? And, and I should note it note that as part of this, you know, one of the things that we did was to to make the structures of all these compounds available um, so that people could do open source drug discovery. So That's for fantastic. compounds that we decided not to work on, people in developing countries can can take them up and, and try to work on them as well. Especially since you, you were able to pull up uh, how many structural classes in this paper from the that that hit both I, is it, I think two hundred and fifty seven or something. Yeah, that was so just a, a that was number. compounds, not classes, but. Oh, compounds. Okay, so there must be at least several dozen classes in there, though. Mm -hmm. That, that oh, yes, are worth absolutely. certainly worth following up. So there, there's you've not just created isolated one molecule that gets past an animal model, but you've created a whole pipeline of, if this one doesn't work, get to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. Right, right. And then really fight that medicinal chemistry. And, until you, you know, we think that's hopefully spur in other places. Because, uh, you know, we recognize that we don't, not everyone has the access to these high throughput screening equipment that we have, um, particularly in, you know, places where they're, affected by malaria. And so we hope by creating, you know, releasing the, the, uh, the electronic data, um, we can spur drug development at other places. Um, are you also making the cell Did line available? You? No, um, we, we had a little disconnect, a little disconnect there with the, the uh, Skype. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the cell line is actually, there are people that that's, um, we obtained that one on an MTA from the University of Paris at Dominique Mazier. Oh. So that wasn't our, our intellectual property there. Um, well, I, I, I think it's, uh, you should uh, be very proud. Congratulations on, on, on the paper and to all the authors. Uh, I'll, I'll name uh, 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 Stephen Meister and David Plouffe as the first authors who collaborated equally to it, to the project. And uh, all the way down the, the line, it was a stellar paper. And, uh, you know, you're, you're providing a whole infrastructure here for uh, malaria research and, um, and, and some very thought-provoking approaches. Um, I, I think I, one last thought I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, in, the, in the industry, um, you know, there's a strong, strong desire to understand it now that we're doing 20, 21st century biotech to understand the mechanism of action, how that drug is binding to an exact protein down so that we can model the, 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 the structure, the binding and, and, you know, do it in a very safe conventional way. Um, and this approach is a cell-based assay whereby you may or may not know the target. Um, what are your thoughts on, on target versus non-target, uh, Drug discovery. Okay. Well, it was again considered slightly heretical when we started this. Uh, um, but, you know, in retrospect, it makes sense. Most of the anti infectives, and I'm not saying that this is true for, for, for oncology compounds or diabetes or whatever, but most of the anti infectives were historically identified in cell based screens, and we can do them much more effectively now. And we also have tools to go back and actually find the target that weren't necessarily available. One of the things that we do very commonly with malaria these days, and which is partially described in the paper, is that we've developed ways of this, what often turns out to be the target by slowly, slowly increasing the exposure of the parasite to, to one of these small molecules until they become semi-resistant. So this takes three or four months and, and you ramp up the increase, the concentration of the drug, never giving it enough to kill it. So it's just, you know, the sort of thing the doctor would tell you never to do with your antibiotic, which is to take it at, at sub-curative doses for four months, right? 
So you do that, and then after this, uh, you clone your parasites. So you go down to a single cell again, and then you you expand them, and then you sequence the the parent that you started with, and you se sequence the progeny that came out of the selection. And then you what you, you you either compare the genome using microarrays, or you can compare them using whole genome next generation sequencing. We did both of these in the paper, and you ask how did the genome change between when we started and when we ended after about four months of, of ex continual exposure to the drug. And what we found is that in many cases, what happens is the actual, it goes back to that yeast experiment I was talking about um, in terms of looking at haploinsufficiency, is the parasites seem to have acquired abilities to amplify the drug target. And, and it tries to escape the drug pressure by putting extra genomic copies of, of the target into the genome. And so we see sometimes, well, Sometimes we see copy number amplifications coming up uh, about 50% of the time, and then we also sometimes get SNPs. And in many cases, these are the same genes, and this will often lead us into uh, the target uh, of, of the compound. And uh, then you can go back and do more traditional target-based drug discovery. See, this is where I learn. <laughs> I'm going to do that. So you, you amplified PF Carl as a gene. Right, and okay. so this was... We don't know for sure if it's a gene involved in resistance. It could possibly be the target, but um, um, it was the only gene that ever came up. And when we did this experiment, 26 million bases of genome sequence information, and typically we only have one or two, three, maybe four changes per genome. You do the selection in parallel three or four times, and if you keep getting the same gene, uh, you know you've got a winner. Um, and it's always different for different drugs. I will recommend this paper uh, to the uh, to the audience, uh, especially those in the life sciences. This is uh, a, a really good um, if you interested in following the philosophy of pick a disease and fix it. Um, this is a, a great paper for that. It, the paper is entitled "Imaging of Plasmodium Liver Stages to Drive Next Generation Antimalarial Drug Discovery." Um, so well, well, thank you very much for coming on the show. This was, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking the time away from the yeah. science and uh, to tell us about it and uh, participate in, uh, you know, our education. So uh, thank you very much for coming on. Um, our guest today was Dr. Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we do have like a two second lag now. Uh, th thank you. Uh, our guest today was Dr. Elizabeth uh, Winzeller, and uh, she is Associate Professor of Genetics at uh, the Scripps Research Institute and Department Head in the Department of Cellular Biology at the Genomics Institute of Novartis Research Foundation, of, of the uh, Novartis Research Foundation in San Diego, California. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming on. Okay. Um, we, I'd also like to thank uh, Liz Romero for handling the audio and video boards today and recording uh, the show. And I'd also like to thank our chief twit, Leo Laporte, and his great team in uh, Petaluma, California that make this possible. And uh, I think the show is edited by Jeff Stewart and will be today. So thanks to, to his efforts as well. And if you have any comments or suggestions, you can reach me at Mark, M-A-R-C, at twit.tv. Uh, or on Twitter at Mark Pelletier, M-A-R-C-P-L-L-E-T-I-E-R. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Pelletier.